Thanks for joining us today. We do have an incredible panel today. We have Dr. Jacinda Bitters with us. She is a family practice physician and also the chief medical officer for ESG Physician Services Group. They're owned by HCA Healthcare, which also owns West Valley Medical Center. We also have Dr. Lyndon Fox. He's an interventional cardiologist with us today. And we have Rachel Nutting. She is a physician assistant who specializes in cardiology. So let's talk self-care for the heart. I told you guys that I was talking to my children yesterday about the heart. And I said, hold your fist up. That is the size of your heart. So we're going to talk about the heart today. First, can each of you all give us just one quick tip about how we can take care of our heart? Exercise. Exercise. Yes, you know, I would say it. Um, I feel like that's what I do all day, every day, is encourage my patients to stay active at least 30 minutes most days of the week. It's kind of a basic minimum um, to keep our hearts active, and it also has other benefits, bone health, mental health, all of that. Yeah, it's just I actually agree with Jacinda, but for variety, I, I would say that the close second is going to be diet, and I'm not sure if we're going to get, yeah, we're going to get into nutrition, um, and with nutrition, just keeping it simple, so I think uh, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more later. So, unfortunately, both the best ones were taken, um, but one of the best things that we can do for their heart health is quit smoking. And so a lot of times I focus on cutting down your cigarettes, even um, making small changes to move toward quitting smoking, including like referral to a smoking cessation clinic or pharmacotherapy. And so I had a friend quit smoking recently and they read a book that was Stop Smoking Now. And they swear by it. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, so, uh, first question, Dr. Box. We did kind of answer this just a little bit. How often should someone exercise 30 minutes? Um, what is the best exercise for heart health? But I'm going to throw just a little bit more of a question in there. Because, like everyone, January rolled around, so I decided to start exercising a little bit. But I went maybe just a little bit too much running that first day and I can hardly breathe and I may be at the age now where I my husband came in and said you're gonna have a heart attack if you go that hard too fast working out is that true should we watch it I mean what's a little bit too much can you help me out here <laughs> uh so yeah I, I will answer that but let me start with with just how um, what is the best exercise in the the answer I always tell my patients is whatever you'll do. Uh, and it's not trying to be sarcastic. It's actually because there's lots of research that shows that no pain, no gain does not work. People will not do things they don't enjoy more than about a couple of weeks. So that's part of why so many New Year's resolutions fail is because people say, oh, I'm going to go do this awesome workout plan. I'm going to suffer like a pig every day and I'm going to be awesome in two months. And it just doesn't work. It's just not the way we're set up. So, you know, or if you try to come up with a plan that's going to be too prohibitive time wise, again, that's not going to work. Uh, any exercise or so research shows that if you're doing nothing, and you start doing something, it will improve your health. So for a lot of my patients, I start there. Uh, I don't set big goals. I'm just like, hey, if you start walking, walk the dog, whatever you want to do, that's going to be awesome. And then we'll go from there. Um, the other thing is as far as the frequency. So this one's a little bit tough. If you are trying to get the, the most bang for the buck, you're really like, I'm going to go and try to really reduce my risk of heart disease and reduce my blood pressure. Actually, we, we would recommend exercising every day or almost every day. The reason for that is because when you exercise, a lot of changes happen in your body chemistry. And interestingly, they last for about 24 hours. So it's just like when you take a medication, it wears off after a while. The benefits of exercise, actually, there's a cumulative benefit, but there's also a short-term benefit. It's a lot of the health benefit that you get from exercise. So the frequency can be more beneficial. 
Um, so that's kind of a down the road goal. Um, the question that Casey asked about, can you do too much? So this is, I'm gonna try to explain this quickly. Um, during exercise, especially at higher intensity, there is statistically a slightly increased risk of having a heart attack and dropping dead. The teeny increased risk, okay? However, if you exercise regularly, your total risk of dropping dead is much lower. <laughs> and I, I, that question comes up a lot because everybody loves to, not everybody, a lot of patients like to say, well, I knew this guy and he ran all the time and he dropped dead. I don't want that to happen to me. Um, so, you know, the point is that if you exercise regularly, uh, you will have a much lower risk of a heart attack or a stroke or something bad happening. And you should not let fear of that stop you from pushing it. The biggest reason I tell patients to push it too hard is just because they're not going to be able to do it very long. So, sorry for my answer. Rachel, we hear about a good resting heart rate versus an active heart rate a lot. Can you explain to us what that looks like for us? And then how do we go about checking that just each day? So in general, a good resting heart rate is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. There are a few different things that can make that higher or lower. Um, generally, if you're on a medication like a beta blocker, it might be a little bit lower. Or if you're an active person or athlete, it can also be a little bit lower. There's also some medications, um, like some antidepressants, like Effexor, that can cause you to have a little bit of increased heart rate or if you're on a stimulant. Um, and there's always the people who just don't fall into that normal range. Um, usually, it's, so most of us have these watches now, and that will automatically check your heart rate whether you want it to or not. Um, so that's one easy way, but if you want to do it manually, you can find your pulse um, kind of right below your thumb. Thank you, Benna. Um, and um, hold your fingers there lightly. For about 15 to 30 seconds, if you hold it for 15 seconds, you multiply by that by four to get your heart rate for that minute. And if you do 30 seconds, you multiply that by two. I usually do 15 seconds because honestly, I can't keep track for 30 seconds with my heart rate. So that's generally what I do. Um, some people also use a pulse ox monitor on their finger and that can be useful as well. Sometimes those things aren't always 100% accurate though. And so if you have a concern, it's best just to call and make an appointment with your primary care doctor or if you see a cardiologist with your cardiologist. Um, regarding active heart rate, there's a handy dandy little formula you can use. Usually it's 220 feet per minute minus your age. And then generally, um, you try to target between 50 to 85 percent of, of that max heart rate for exercise. And so if you're first starting out, it's good to start with 50 percent of that max heart rate, which might seem absurdly low. And then moderate exercise is generally 50 to 70 percent of that max heart rate. And then intense exercise would be 70 to 85 percent of that max heart rate. Um, if you are going over that, you might want to dial it back a little bit. And if you are way under that, you can also try to intensify your exercise somewhat. Um, and then also go by how you feel. And there's always somebody who doesn't quite fall into that general rule of thumb. All right, Dr. Bitters, let's talk nutrition. What are some good foods for the heart? Generally, a Mediterranean diet is one of the most heart healthy diets. So, fish, lots of vegetables, legumes, things that actually come from the earth that aren't very processed, not a lot of refined sugars. Um, that would be just kind of a general rule of thumb for a heart healthy diet. Can I follow up really quickly in this room? I don't want to say no red meat because we all love our red meat so can you talk to us about red meat and heart health? sure i mean red meat is a, a reasonable protein we just try to limit our servings per week uh, one or two a week is reasonable but to do it every single day we might just see a little bit more saturated fat associated with that and again in in our standard american diet we see a little bit more processing like with the hamburgers and things like that so um, not the most healthy preparations of that red meat. So think about leaner cuts. 
things that are less processed. No. Okay. Here. Okay. How, uh, Rachel, how important is a good night's sleep for your heart? So there was recently um, research about this a few years ago that involved sleep being um, included in the American Heart Association Essential 8. It used to be something 7 and now it's Essential 8. And so sleeping less than seven hours a night is correlated with worse heart health, whether that's hypertension, diabetes, um, atrial fibrillation, or strokes. And it's not totally clear whether it's the less sleep itself that causes that or if something could have another condition that causes worse sleep, like sleep apnea or depression or increased stress. Um, or heart failure where they're not really breathing very well at night. And so usually I try to talk to people about trying to aim for seven to nine hours of sleep at night. Um, if you're a child, usually it's a lot of times it's more than that. And um, in addition to, to what I said prior, um, not sleeping well usually results in bad choice and like worse choices in food, um, like maybe eating more sweets or drinking more caffeinated beverages that have a lot of sugar in it in order to stay awake. And also like if I don't sleep well, I don't feel like exercising. So that 24 hour benefit of exercise kind of just goes away um, after I don't get a good night of sleep. And so there's and there's also some ways that you can improve your sleep quality um, with improving your sleep hygiene or talking to your doctor about maybe being tested for sleep apnea or another sleep condition. Now, this is a good question because we have a lot of people on medications and a lot of people taking even over the counter uh, drugs. So, how do we know if a medication is safe for our heart, Dr. Bob? Well, um, so this is the question really that comes up a lot around side effects. Um, I mean, especially we are fortunate that we have a lot of effective treatments, um, things that people used to just die from because we didn't really have treatments, uh, we now can extend life a long time. Uh, but one of the things you run into is, you know, side effects. And I get a lot of questions about side effects. So trying to explain side effects, I think it's important to realize that when you take a medication, it is altering the chemistry of your body in some way. Now, hopefully mostly for the better, but it is almost impossible to alter the body's chemistry without the risk of a side effect. So if it has zero side effects, most of the time it's because it's not doing anything. You know, like a banana has no side effect, but it's not going to lower your blood pressure. So, so that's one thing just to keep in mind that that's part of where, you know, that comes in. And, you know, how do we know about the side effects? And this gets into that question about how do we know things are safe? So love them or hate them, we have this thing called the FDA. And, uh, you know, that what they do is they require that before a drug can hit the market, they have to do trials. There's four, there's actually three levels of trials they go through. And then the final trial is what's called an efficacy trial, where they actually show that the drug does what they say it's going to do. And through all these trials, they have to log every side effect that anybody reports. And I've been involved in research trials and there's huge forms. And every time something happens, you have to fill out the form and send it in. So the studies will have like usually anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 people in the study. So they capture all sorts of things, some of which are just random, you know, like bad things happen. Somebody had, you know, too much pasta that day and they had a tummy ache and that got reported as a side effect. So they have to go through, so they go through that and have to statistically determine which ones are actually associated with the drug, that it, that it really does happen and it's not just random chance, which is why these trials have to be so big. They have to have so many people to determine all this. So as a result, you get this long list of things they can do. And I bring this up because patients come in with this list and they're like, oh my God, you know, this thing is going to cause like 20 side effects. Um, and the reality is, you know, they, they have to look at the percentage of how often that happens. So just because it's listed as a side effect doesn't mean it happens to 100% of people. It may only be 3% of people, but it's still a risk that it comes with the drug. So the thing us doctors have to do is we look at the risk 
versus the potential benefit and you kind of do the math as to which way that's going to pan out. Is it really worth the benefit versus the risk? And then being aware of those so that we monitor for them down the road. So, so the point I'm getting at is just the fact that most drugs do have a risk of side effects. Um, it's generally considered to be reasonably safe to take it or else it never gets approved for market. And then the idea of whether or not you're going to take the drug is something to kind of make a decision with your, your physician about, you know, looking at the benefits versus the potential risk to sort out that that's something that's going to be right for you. So. Thank you. Dr. Bitters, what about heart attack symptoms? Because we know that these can look a little different between men and women. So let's talk about that. Absolutely. I, I would say generally in our male population, we have kind of the classic heart attack symptoms. So crushing, chest pain, may radiate to the left jaw or down the left arm, associated with shortness of breath or sweatiness. So kind of what you would see in DVD in the movies. When someone has a heart attack, that's kind of what we think about with our male counterparts. Um, in women, certainly that can be the case as well, but we might see some more vague symptoms, nausea or dizziness. Maybe a sense, just a general sense of doom. I can't put my finger on it. Something's not right. I don't know what's going on here. Or maybe the pain radiates to the left shoulder. So, you know, again, if we're having some nausea and left shoulder pain, we might think more GI symptoms instead of traditional heart attack type symptoms. So we have to have kind of a higher threshold of suspicion sometimes for our female patients just to uh, broaden our differential and think outside of just what, you know, maybe just the, you know, GI that we have to think about cardiac a little bit more. Um, so those would be some of the main differences. So I guess on that note, for all of you, when is it time to call the doctor? I'd say certainly if things are not right. If you're having recurrent symptoms, um, that's more than just a one-off. And if you feel like something is not right, that is a good time to go discuss it with your doctor. Yeah, that actually just into took my advice that I know that's great because because this comes up a lot like patients say you know what what symptoms should I look for and it's tough because there's no script that people can really follow and, it, and there's research to back up the fact that intuitively people know something's wrong when there's a problem with their heart and I can tell you numerous times that patients have come into the emergency room they had some kind of vague symptoms that didn't quite make sense. And they said, I just feel like something's not right. And, and I feel like things are wrong. Something's off. I'm a little bit worried. Um, you know, and, and as a physician, we take that into account because I'm like, whatever's going on, it was enough. They came to the emergency room and nobody wants to go to the emergency room, right? It's a big pain in the rear. So, so again, I, I tell my patients that I'm like, if it's something that you think might be related to your heart and it's bothering you, then just call us. So um, to piggyback on everybody else, um, I always try to tell people that there's a question to give us a call. I'd much rather have if somebody has a question about their medication or swelling or how they're feeling. I'd much rather have them call and discuss it than kind of cowboy it up and um, maybe not get the care they need. And so if that's something else, you know, if there's a question about a treatment plan, much better to call than just to wait it out. Or if it's not going, like if they have a side effect, give us a call so that we can help you feel better. Um, and got a follow up. I would say um, a time not to call is if you're having chest pain with shortness of breath and sweating, go to the ER. I've been on call where people have called me with these symptoms to, to diagnose or treat over the phone. Absolutely not. If it is a very standard sort of chest pain type syndrome, don't wait, go to the emergency room. That's when you call 911 and have the ambulance come to your house. Okay. Um, we uh, we have time. So if there are any questions. All right. Question. What about red wine? What about red wine? That's a good one. So yes, I mean, it, it was the American College of Cardiology that kind of brought this to light. Mm -hmm. There are some heart healthy benefits and that's actually included in the Mediterranean diet. So one standard glass for women a few nights a week or two for men. The other side of that coin is that alcohol is um, correlated with lots of different types of cancer. Um, recent medical groups and guidelines have said there's really no safe threshold for alcohol as far as cancer risk. 
So for people who enjoy red wine, it is reasonable to enjoy that in moderation, and we can have some heart healthy benefits for that. But we wouldn't recommend starting alcohol if you're not currently an alcohol user. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wonder if you could explain a lot of people in our day and age have a lot of uh, panic slash anxiety symptoms, and they go to the ER for that. Can you kind of, in your opinion, when somebody can know the difference of it's just anxiety or it's just panic, and you're not really having a heart attack? Because I know that is a big experience with very people. That's a great question. So knowing the difference between panic attacks and anxiety attacks versus an onset of heart attack. So you can. <laughs> um, and, and actually, you know, once you've been evaluated, then you have some track record to, to go off of. But um, I can tell you there is a well-established thing of people being diagnosed with panic attacks and actually they have a cardiac condition. The most common thing is actually arrhythmias. So people will have abnormal heart rhythms where their heart suddenly takes off and starts going 170 beats a minute. And then it'll last for a little while, then it'll stop. And, you know, they've been told for years they had panic attacks until they finally get evaluated. So, so unfortunately, even that one, yeah, we can't really give you a, a buy. Yeah, I mean, we, you just need to be evaluated. Yep, you and then you. Um, in the last, say, 40 years, has there been an increase or a decrease in heart attacks? And What's kind of the underlying factors that's driving that trend? In the last 40 years, have, has there been an increase or decrease in heart attacks? And what is driving that trend? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, this is in my field. But yeah, there has been a decrease. There's also been a decrease in the number of STEM procedures. Um, and, and I will put out there, I, I get no money from drug companies. And I have my own beefs with the drug companies. However, <laughs> Um, one of the big theories behind the fact that, that we're seeing less repeat customers is all the medications, you know, because people died and lifestyle is not getting better, unfortunately. But they're uh, starting in really around the mid to late 2000s. There's been a steady decline in the rate of, of heart attacks by, you know, million people for the incidents per capita. Uh, and also for stent procedures, which I do, we put stents in people's hearts, the number of people having stance has been steadily declining as well. <laughs> okay, so my question is about, I guess it applies to everybody, but specifically to teenagers and energy drinks. Oh, I have two teenagers myself, so I literally argue about it, but what are you guys thoughts? thought? This is a great question. The question was, what do they have to say about teenagers and energy drinks? Ooh, and can we even say adults and energy yeah. drinks? So let's talk about both. Yeah, I have a big pediatric population in my practice, and the kids are resilient, so they can get away with a lot of things that you know may hurt hurt them later in life. Um, we, you know, we will see maybe a very small percentage of arrhythmias and things like that in kiddos who are consuming energy drinks all the time. There may also be some other bad side effects like mental health side effects, anxiety, that sort of a thing. However, as we if we create that habit and we get into adulthood, we do see an increased rate, you could probably speak to it as well, uh, of arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, things like that, in people who are consuming those really high amounts of caffeine on a regular basis. There's also a slight increased risk of heart attack as people are older and drinking energy drinks. And there also might be a lot of supplements in them that aren't really well studied and that could also cause some harm too. What kind of harm do supplements cause? So, <laughs> so a popular run we see is people taking St. John's wort, um, which interacts with a lot of medications. It kind of makes one of the enzymes our body uses to process medications work way faster than normal. It's an enzyme inducer. And that, so that makes your body process different drugs like you know um, statins, which are commonly used to decrease cardiovascular risk not be as effective, which can make a big difference. I 
much more than individual at risk if there's a um, history of it in the family, say my mother and my grandmother both have had um, bypass surgeries. And, and then after that, at what point should I start seeing somebody for that? Well, this is a great question. How much more are you at risk if you have cardiovascular history in your family? And when should you start seeing a specialist? So, um, the way you just they determine those risk factors actually is so they looked at the incidence of whatever risk factor we're looking at and the association with that of your probability of having a heart attack within the next five to 10 years. So statistically significant family history is that you had a first degree relative that was a male younger than 55. So premature coronary artery disease or female younger than 65. And this comes up all the time. A lot of people come in like I have bad family history, and then you know, my mom just had bypass surgery. So just saying statistically, it does not confer risk on you um, unless it meets those criteria. Uh, and it's actually a small incremental risk. So um, there are certain conditions though that are genetically uh, associated with a very high risk, and that's one in particular is called familial hyperlipidemia. So if your family tree is full of people having heart attacks at a young age, you might want to be checked for that one because that's where that usually shows up. Um, and it's basically people who genetically their body produces extremely high levels of cholesterol. And if you look at their family tree, you see through the years, you know, people having heart attacks in their 40s and 50s and 30s even. Um, so that's where, you know, if you're not having any symptoms, if you just are looking at generally you're like your family history, then it's going to be the traditional things of risk factor modification and things that you usually do with your primary care. You don't necessarily need to see a cardiologist. It's going to be the same kind of things that come up. And for the most part, we don't have great screening tests. So it's not necessarily recommended that you, for instance, go have a stress test or something like that. Well, thank you so much to our incredible panel. We are out of time, but they will be here after for a little bit. And then we also have Darcy and Ruth who will be in the back and they will be taking your blood pressure for free. We also have this Love Your Heart flyer. You can find out how old your heart is by scanning the QR code on there, taking an online assessment. And we are starting up our Create a Living Will class, the first Thursday of every month, starting March 7th. So be sure to check that out. Thank you again so much, and you guys were wonderful. Thank you to Lindy and Travis for planning this all. Have a great day.